uh, we are going uh, to uh, do our Bible reading. We're going to actually be reading Colossians first. Uh, and this is uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. And we're going to go all the way down uh, to chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, I'm going to bring it up in this book. Every week so far, I've said, I really need to put a bookmark, and I never do. Um, but we're going to be looking uh, on page uh, one nine, uh, sorry, 924 in the Bibles uh, that uh, you might have received at the, at the front of the church. If you don't have a Bible, let me encourage you to have a Bible before you. It is always good to be able to read the God's Word together. So we're going to go from verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings uh, for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints." To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, We now have the Bible reading. Uh, So I'd invite somebody to come up. Who's Sorry, who's doing the Bible reading? Me. Oh, sorry. I'll invite myself to come up. And I'm going to read through Daniel 2, 17 to 23. Uh, So that's on page 691, if you have the pew Bibles, the church Bibles. So Daniel chapter 2, 17 to 23, and then 27 to 30. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have no under- uh, to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Uh, If we jump down to verse 27, Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. 
But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have, more than in all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Now this is God's word, and I'll invite Adam up now. Now, if I was to ask you what brings you joy, what would your answer be? Now, I can tell you uh, what Marie um, Kondo's uh, answer would be, and that is removing the junk from your house. Uh, Perhaps you haven't heard of Marie Kondo. Um, Well, let me tell you, she had a TV show back in 2019, just before COVID hit our shores, uh, and her TV show hit the world by storm. It was released on Netflix, and it was called Tidying Up. Uh, I certainly watched it. My wife and I loved it. Uh, She would show people how to organise their house and then remove uh, the items they didn't need. And these people had a lot of things in their household. Uh, And so they would ask for her uh, to help them to remove the things from their their life. And they would ask her, how do we know what things to get rid of? And she would say, you would pick up the item and you would ask yourself, does this item spark joy in your life? If the item sparks joy, you keep it. If the item doesn't spark joy, you get rid of it. Uh, This show took people by storm, as I said, but no longer was uh, deciding what to keep in your life uh, was about discipline or self-control. Decision-making was based on how you're feeling at the time, whether or not the item can bring you happiness. If I was to offer some deep philosophical insights, as I know you all love all so much, uh, I would say that this method was an expression of removing the things from the life around you that restrict you from having happiness and a joyful life within yourself. Uh, That is, remove the mess in your life and feel the joy in yourself. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? So it made me wonder how Marie would handle someone like Paul, who states that he, he rejoices in suffering for the sake of the church. Uh, suffering uh, should not spark joy uh, in... Oh, spark joy. Uh, so Marie's method um, would suggest that, well, you should avoid suffering altogether. But verse 24 sets the tone for Paul's motivation as a minister. It sets the foundation of why he's doing the things that he is doing. So let's read verse 24 together. Uh, We say, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, I will say, but I want to first point out that Paul, uh, Paul's suffering is not for the sake of him suffering. Paul is not a masochist. He is not getting joy out of uh, pain or humiliation. Paul's joy comes from the purpose behind the suffering. He suffers for the church. And it seems that Paul has come to terms with his role as the minister or the servant of God uh, who proclaims the gospel. He first acknowledges that uh, suffering is an expectation that we uh, should embrace. And second, we endure suffering for the sake of proclaiming the gospel. And Paul wants to nail these points down by first claiming that his flesh is filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Uh, That's quite a bold claim Paul um, is making. Uh, That is very bold indeed. And it's a line that many scholars have used a lot of ink and a lot of paper to try to explain what Paul is getting at here. But rest assured, Paul is not suggesting that he is taking on anybody's sin. He certainly has plenty of his own sin to deal with first. 
Paul has just spent a good portion of the letter elevating Christ to a high position to say that he is God. And while elevating Christ, he makes the, um, he makes the statement that Christ's work of redemption is sufficient to reconcile us to God the Father. If we were to take Paul's claim in verse 24 as contradicting what he said before, and him saying that he is covering for Jesus where Jesus has dropped the ball, well, Paul would, making, would be making the claim that he contributes to the church's uh, redemption or atonement. And I will say that would make no sense, and I would say that Paul would be absolutely insane at this point. Here is what Paul is getting at, and it's what is meant by filling up. It is the inevitable suffering that comes by being a witness of Jesus Christ and proclaiming the gospel. Perhaps we won't face the same level of suffering Paul faced. We have uh, have to remember at this point in time when Paul is writing this letter, he is in prison for sharing the gospel. So suffering was a reality for him. He's suffering right now. Not only is suffering inevitable, according to Paul, but it must be one that has to be endured. Paul's life is embodying the cross. Paul lives for the sake of Christ, therefore suffers as a result of his commitment to him. And so why does he endure? Let's look at the end of verse 25. To make the word of God fully known. He wants to see the gospel, the complete revelation of the redemption, fully known to all who hear. Like I said, Paul isn't isn't suffering for the sake of suffering. The suffering is purposeful. It is because he is following and declaring Christ as Saviour and Lord. I read a story of a missionary back in the 19th century. His name is Adoniam Judson. Has anyone heard of this missionary before? You've heard this missionary before? I hadn't heard of this missionary before, before picking up the book, uh, Filling Up the Afflictions of Christ by John Piper. Uh, This man uh, came from a Christian household. He was a genius. He could read by the age of three. He was at university by the time he was 16. And soon after leaving university, he would have an incredible conversion after he had drifted away from the faith. Now, I would suggest reading his story about that conversion because it was really a remarkable conversion. Um, And if you don't want to read it, I'm more than happy to tell you what happened after the service. Just come and grab me. But it was from this conversion that it inspired him to travel east to Burma. And he became a missionary. And, but even going to Burma presented challenges for him, like becoming a prisoner of war for almost a year before escaping. Then after becoming a prisoner of war, he then went to Burma and would see two of his wives die along with seven of his children and many colleagues due to the poor conditions that they were living in and the diseases that were around, such as malaria and cholera. He would then be placed into prison again for 17 months and his wife sacrificed even to the point of death to see her husband survive while in prison and she was heavily heavily pregnant. He preached for almost 10 years with little to no converts, yet continued to translate the Bible for the people. And for almost 19 years of hard and strenuous work, uh, it, it, took him, it took 19 years for there to be a movement of conversion in the people. He would have a mental breakdown, which would then force him uh, into isolation, into the jungle for three years. He would then return and continue his mission, um, his mission work. And despite all of these trials, and he endured for 40 years in Burma until his death. 
His faith in God's providence and ability to sustain him uh, was clearly evident in his life and in his work. He would be recorded of saying, If I had not felt certain that every additional trial was ordered by infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived my accumulated sufferings. In other words, if he didn't know the love and the mercy of God the Father, he would not have been able to survive the sufferings that came because he proclaimed the gospel. And he knew the love and mercy of God the Father because Jesus revealed it to him. Just as Jesus continues to reveal the love and the mercy of God the Father to us today through his word. David Powell uh, shares a shocking answer from pastors in underground churches in closed societies. When he asked what the greatest uh, worry was for their church, they responded with, the end of the persecution of our churches. That's quite a shocking answer for us, am I right? Especially for people who live in an open society. But it was what David said is next that I think should give us some pause. It is not that faithfulness to the gospel necessarily entails suffering in every instance. Even Paul occasionally garnered a decent reception. But we might question our faithfulness if we never suffer for Christ and the gospel in ways Paul did. Now, I know that that's quite a difficult thing to hear. It is natural for us to want to avoid suffering. Let me say this, it certainly doesn't spark joy in my life. And I could say that it probably doesn't spark joy in yours either, am I right? But if we avoid suffering completely, how much trust or faith do we have in God? Now, I'm not suggesting, like along with David, that suffering will happen all the time. Okay, Perhaps you have shared the gospel with many people and have never faced backlash. That would be because of God's grace, if that is the case. But this is the warning that I'm offering to you. We shouldn't avoid suffering completely by not proclaiming the gospel. This would mean, if, I, if this is true, this would mean that the gospel is quite an important message, but it's a controversial message. If sharing or living the gospel would cause suffering or lead us into hardships, it must be an astonishing message. And I think verse 26 really nails that. Verse 26. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. <coughs> this redemption God offers has been a mystery throughout the Old Testament and the message um, isn't just for the Jews, it's now including the Gentiles as well. In other words, this message is for the entire world. The mystery is this. Christ is in you. The hope of glory. Christ. Paul, uh, Paul's use of mystery uh, seems to come from Daniel 2, as we've read. Uh, this isn't agreed by everyone, but I do think it has some weight. When Daniel was asked to interpret the king's dream, it, uh, he pointed to the mystery of God's kingdom that was to come in the la latter days. Paul takes Daniel's future concept of God's marvelous kingdom and applies it to the king, that is Christ. Daniel's prophecy is fulfilled according to Paul. It is fulfilled in Christ himself. So the purpose of the ministry that is, 
is to proclaim him, the one who holds the glorious hope of God's kingdom, to warn, to teach, so to present everyone mature in Christ. Up until this point, Paul has been showing that all who believe are united to Christ, that his body, the church, exists in him. And now Paul is flipping the script and saying, now Christ is in you. Through the Spirit, Christ is in you. Paul takes the entirety of God's word and simplifies it for us. Christ is in you and you are in Christ. That is the mystery. But even for Paul, there is a reason for the work. His goal is to see people become mature in Christ, or as the Greek has it, complete or perfect in Christ. Uh, But it is to see people grow and to continue to grow and to know Christ fully, because when we know Jesus, we come to know God the Father. Uh, something that we've done as an uh, evangelical church as a whole is to separate the idea of evangelism and discipleship. Now, uh, first, we evangelize to bring people to Christ, and then we disciple them into Christ. As someone who is a reformed evangelical who loves categories, this isn't wrong in itself. I have found it quite useful uh, when I was doing evangelism because it makes proclaiming the gospel not so complicated. You do this, and then you do this, and bing, bada, boom, everything falls into place. But we have to consider how Paul sees it. Paul doesn't make that kind of distinction. Evangelism and discipleship are two sides of the same coin. Here's what I mean. Paul evangelizes to make disciples, not converts. He wants to see Jesus' followers, not Jesus' believers. Not only is there uh, becoming a disciple, but there is the ongoing discipleship that sees believers continue to grow in Jesus. It is, believing, uh, it is believers investing in believers. It is not just seeing people become followers of Jesus. It is, uh, it's, but it's, um, it's the continued investment in them to see them continue to be followers of Jesus. Think back over your own Christian walk. Is there someone you can say had a huge impact in your own faith? Someone who invested in you. So I can say in my own life that, someone, that uh, there was someone who spent months and months and months working in my life and that I would become a Christian. And I didn't know back then that they were working to see me become a disciple of Christ. Got a ladybug. You can put it up there. Good work. So here's the challenge that I want to bounce off while you think about that person in your life that had such a heavy impact in your faith. Who is it in your life right now that you can invest in? Have them over for dinner, spend time at the park, read the Bible, pray. Is there someone in your life right now that you can invest in to see them grow more and more, to know the Jesus, the one who brings all redemption and forgiveness. Great job, mate. You can put it up on the tree. Perhaps you are thinking to yourself that this might be too difficult. It's too hard. Or maybe, Adam, you are asking way too much of me right now. That might be fair. Paul has a response. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. 
Paul is able to proclaim the gospel and share the message of Christ in you to see people mature in Christ because Christ, because it is Christ who is giving him the power and the ability to do it. Here's the grace I want you to hear from me right now. It is Christ in you that gives you the ability and who works powerfully within you. This isn't about how great you are. This is about how great he is. This is about Christ and all that he does for you. To see the gospel proclaimed. To see people brought in to be disciples and followers of Christ. And Paul really wants to nail this home. In chapter 2, Paul encourages them in two ways. First, being knit together in love, that is the relationship between the Christians, uh, Christian brothers and sisters that are found in Christ. And two, together they may have the full riches of the assurance, understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. And who is Christ. This is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ is a treasure that all wisdom and knowledge are hidden. This is how precious Jesus is in our life. He is all you need. It's important for Paul that the Colossians get this, and it's important for us to get this, because there were people during the Colossians time trying to persuade the church that Jesus wasn't enough they needed more to be enlightened of spiritual matters or have access to more knowledge or to have uh, to do be able to do more amazing work Jesus wasn't enough now we can't be sure exactly what Paul was trying to address at this moment and we might look more closely at it next week But right now, Paul is making this clear statement that I really want to hit home. Christ is all you need. It is not what you know or do that makes you more important or gives you the ability to disciple or share the gospel. Christ is the precious treasure where all wisdom and knowledge exists. Be encouraged that In Christ, you can have the riches. To have the riches means the abundance of assurance, understanding and knowledge that is found in Christ, together with the love of your brothers and sisters. It is this faith in Jesus that causes Paul to have joy. See, back in chapter 1, verse 24, Paul states that he rejoices in suffering for the sake of the church, despite never meeting this church. But it is here that I believe Paul can continue to have joy in suffering because of the order, the good order, and the firmness of their faith in Jesus. Even though Paul did not directly share the gospel with these people, his ministry did influence the church starting. Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles, and it was a Gentile, perhaps Epaphras, uh, who started this church. The suffering Paul endured was worth it because the end result was others coming to truly know Jesus, the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. On Thursday night, I asked the growth group one question. Does the hope of the gospel motivate you in everyday life? Now I ask, I'm going to add to it. To motivate you for what purpose? Do you see the joyful purpose in seeing Jesus known by all people? To see people grow to know Jesus more, to endure suffering and rejoice in people's faith, that you can have the full riches of assurance and understanding and knowledge in your own life because of Christ? Let me encourage you and let me remind you of this truth. The mystery is this. 
Christ is in you. Rest in his ability to save and to work powerfully within you. Proclaiming the gospel may come with a cost. But with the power of Christ who is in you, you may persevere so that all may hear and become mature in the mystery of God and the hidden treasure who is Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray that you be with us as we uh, come to declare the, and proclaim the gospel, the one that, came and that saved us from our own sin. Lord, we pray that we may not lose sight that you are our treasure, the one who brings all wisdom and knowledge. Lord, we pray that we may endure suffering in order that the gospel may be heard, that others may come to follow Christ and may mature in him, to know that Christ uh, is in us and we are in Christ. And Lord, we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand up and sing Build My Life. Let's stand together.